Today we're gonna to take a look at the M3 Pro 14 inch MacBook Pro after nine months of use. Now I have used this computer primarily as an editing computer while traveling. Now I didn't get the base model this time. I ended up specking it out a little bit. I got the full 12 core CPU and 18 core GPU model with a one terabyte SSD, but the base amount of RAM. After using this for the past nine months, I realized that for the most part, I could have actually got the base model and saved a huge chunk of change. So if you're interested in the M3 Pro MacBook Pro, I'm going to go over my workflow and how I use this computer. And if you're in a similar situation to me, you may be able to save a huge chunk of change when it comes to buying an M3 Pro MacBook Pro. Or if you're not in the same situation as me and you're interested in maybe getting more RAM than the 18 gigs that come with the M3 Pro MacBook Pro. I'm going to explain my situation and how I kind of scientifically analyze what I do to realize that the 18 gigabytes was good enough for me, but using my methods, you may realize you may need more RAM or whatever it may be. And this video may set you on a path to getting a higher spec M3 Pro MacBook Pro. Just a little bit of background information about me if you've never been here before. My name is Jeff Fagan. I'm a filmmaker, DP, and content creator based in South Florida. I film with primarily red, black magic, Sony cameras like we're doing right now. My main computer for the past few years has actually been a 2020 Intel-based iMac. It was the last Intel-based iMac that Apple made, and I bought it just because it had a lot of the new features that were going into the Apple Silicon computers, and I was able to user upgrade my RAM. So I've got a crazy amount of RAM in that machine, and I really needed it because I also needed a computer that I could use boot camp and have Windows for certain applications that I need for work. Now, at the time in 2020, we were still in the pandemic, and I wasn't traveling quite as much, but I still was traveling. So I got the M1 MacBook Air just because of the price and the performance, but I got the base model. And for a few years, because of my workflow, I was able to make that base model work. I got eight gigabytes of RAM. A lot of people said, don't do it, but I was really managing my memory. One application that I'm going to heavily reference throughout today's video is the Activity Monitor, which is a free app that comes installed on all Apple computers. And the activity monitor lets you see how much CPU, GPU usage you're using at any time. It also lets you monitor your RAM usage. So when I was using the M1 base model MacBook Air, it was only eight gigs and I was editing these crazy projects in DaVinci. So the two things I was doing was one, I was always monitoring my memory to at least know when I do certain projects, what kind of RAM usage I was using. The other thing was in DaVinci Resolve, which is my primary editor, I was actually editing everything in 720p and then changing it to a 4K timeline when I went to go export. By editing in 720p, it actually brought my RAM usage down a lot when I was editing. So I was really only using around 12 12 gigabytes of RAM at any given time. Now on the eight gigabyte base model M1 Air, I was using a lot of swap memory, but obviously by knowing that, using this 18 gigabyte M3 Pro, I knew I wouldn't go anywhere near the amount of RAM that comes with this, so I didn't really need to upgrade that. I ended up upgrading from the M1 Air to the M3 Pro originally just because of ports. I started traveling a lot more, and when I was doing some of my more complex editing, only having two Thunderbolt 3 ports was just kind of limiting because one, sometimes I was using the charge, and the other, I always had an SSD plugged in. So when I upgraded to this M3 Pro, the big thing I wanted more than anything, more than an upgraded GPU, RAM, is I wanted a bigger hard drive. I only had 256 gigs on that M1 Air. Although the base model M3 Pro even comes with 500, which in hindsight, I probably would have been okay with, I decided to go for a one terabyte drive because when I'm editing, I wanna be able to use this laptop as a laptop. I don't wanna have all these things plugged in if I'm just editing on my lap or I'm on an airplane, I wanna be able to have my projects that I'm working on just on the hard drive in the computer. So that was one of the reasons I went for the one terabyte. At the time, I got it within the first week of the M3 Pros being announced. So the only way I could get the one terabyte drive pre-configured at Best Buy was to get the full CPU and GPU and then not actually have the RAM upgrade. So that's why I got this specific model. And then after using it, I changed my workflow a little bit because I had more RAM. I had a newer computer that was a little bit more powerful than the M1 uh, MacBook Air. What I started doing is instead of editing in 720, 
I edited my projects in 1080p. Instead of using 12 gigabytes of RAM, it brought me up to using between 14 and 16 gigabytes of RAM editing in 1080p. I typically only change to 4K when I'm going to export a project, which I noticed is much quicker on this M3 Pro than the M1 MacBook Air. That was one of the things that was really nice to move to this computer. The overall theme you're gonna see in today's video is although I don't monitor my memory all the time from editing so much on these computers, I pretty much know what tasks are using what approximate amount of RAM. And when I'm editing, I pretty much just stay on DaVinci, I'm not using any other programs, so I don't run any other programs. That's why whatever the RAM is in DaVinci, that's pretty much the RAM I'm using. But there are a lot of users out there that just don't wanna memory manage. They wanna just use what they wanna use, and I think if you're in that kind of boat, you should get the more RAM. It, you're, you're gonna be limited on the 18 gigs, even though swap memory is really great. The more swap memory you use in the long term, if you're constantly using swap memory, your hard drive's overall lifetime will be decreased just because you're doing so many read writes on there. I'm happy to memory manage because I'm using this as a travel computer. I think a lot of users that don't wanna worry about the kind of RAM usage they're doing, you may be using this as just your everyday all-in-one computer. This may be your only computer, so I totally get why you're going to want to do all these upgrades. For me, although I am traveling a lot more now, I just wanted to have the best bang for my buck and not spend like crazy on a computer that I'm really only going to be using while I'm traveling. Not everyone's gonna wanna have to turn off all their apps, manage their usage, I totally get it. And that's why I say getting the base model isn't for everybody. And it's part of the reason I wanted to do today's video because a lot of the tech reviewers out there that are reviewing computers are reviewing them and giving you advice based on their usage. So that's why I wanna let you know what my usage is. So when I say that I could get away with the base model, if you like the way I utilize my workflow, you may be able to get away with the base model and save a lot of money. Or you may realize all these people that say you can get away with the base model, I don't use my computer anywhere near the way they use it. And I should definitely not get a base model and go for something more beefy. Now let's talk about the performance to battery life ratio. A big thing when the M3 Pro came out was how Apple changed the way they distributed performance and efficiency cores. The more performance cores you would have on your computer, the more overall powerful the computer would be. So when this M3 Pro came out, they actually took away some of the performance cores and replaced them with efficiency cores. Now, even though each individual core was more powerful than let's say each individual core on the M2 Pro, a lot of reviewers came out of the gate saying the M3 Pro is just not going to be as powerful as an M2 Pro. And when you look at it core to core, yeah, that makes sense what they're saying. But in reality, using it in a real world situation, that's not the case. And they're leaving out a really big thing where having the more efficiency cores and having the more powerful performance cores you are getting much better battery life on this machine. And for me, the much better battery life is a huge deal because I use this as a travel computer on the battery a lot. So there have been multiple days where I've gone out, I've had a full battery, and I've gone and edited for multiple hours at a time on a project, stopped, not charged my computer, and the next day, edit again for multiple hours on this high-end project without charging the computer. When Apple changed up the performance and the efficiency cores, it made sense. They're trying to make the battery life better, especially at higher performing situations. I have not noticed the performance decrease that a lot of people say you are going to get. I get it that overall, when you look at specs, the M2 Pro in some situations may slightly, slightly be better, but at that point, you're discounting the efficiency cores. And so for the slight difference in performance that you're really not going to see in real world use, you are discounting the battery life performance that you are going to see in real world use that I think a lot of these reviewers just jumped the gun to get their videos out. And I get it. They wouldn't have known this without a long-term usage of this computer, but it was a big deal. And I think a lot of reviewers missed the mark. And that's, again, why I'm coming out here. You got to just know what your workflow, your usage is going to be and take all of these reviews with a grain of salt. Figure out how these reviews pertain to your usage. 
Along with the battery life is the charging. I noticed the charging is incredibly fast on this computer. Now, most of the time, although this computer has MagSafe, I've pretty much been charging via USB-C. The reason being is I have so many different cameras now that utilize USB-C power delivery charging. I've been able to just bring like one or two power bricks with me in one or two actual USB-C power delivery cords and charge all of my devices. Better resolution on these 14 inch XDR display has been really nice while traveling, but it's a 14 inch computer, so it is still kind of small. That's why I use only one app at a time when I'm editing, because I'm not gonna be able to have DaVinci open and you know be look web surfing. I'm not using multiple screens on this computer. If you are going to use multiple screens, you're kind of using it like a desktop at that point. I get it, you're probably gonna want the RAM upgrade. There's a lot of really great deals right now, especially if you're looking at the base model M3 Pro MacBook Pro, as you can get it for around $1,700, 300 less than MSRP. I wish that deal was around, because I would've jumped at it. It's, it's pretty much $1,000 less than even I paid for this laptop, but I've got my use out of it. Just to wrap things up, having the one terabyte drive did really help me, although I think I could have gotten away with 500 gigs. Having one terabyte, I don't have to memory manage. I just put my projects on the computer and take them off when I'm done editing. The overall performance has not been an issue for me. I really like how this computer performs. It's in some ways more than I actually needed out of a travel computer, but I like that as a lot of the times I'm on the go with either my Red or my Black Magic. I'm editing raw files, so it's nice to have a computer that can handle it. Now, one thing I did do to this computer that's software-based, but I started doing it because of how I actually use this iPhone 15. There's a software that lets you software limit you're charging to where you only charge to 80% instead of 100%. By doing that, you're not always fully charging your battery every single time. And in the long term, you will have increased battery life and performance. By limiting it to 80%, you're not constantly charging it all the way up to 100 and you're saving the long-term performance of the computer. It's actually a free app. I'll put a link to it in the description below. If you're interested, make sure to take a look at it. There are some users where they always need to go to 100% because of what they're doing, but if you're interested in saving the long-term battery performance of your computer, definitely take a look at this app. If you have any questions, anything I maybe didn't go over in today's video, make sure to ask in the comments below, and if you got knowledge and value out of today's video, please make sure to hit that like, subscribe, and notification bell to keep up to date with the latest videos on the channel. Till next time, my name is Jeff Fagan. Thank you for joining me as always, and I will catch you in the next video.